So welcome to the Wild Acres Week. Um, some of you may know I'm Ashley Downey and I'm delighted to be hosting today's talks, which poses the question, what does a healthy environment look like? We have fan four fantastic speakers for you this evening and in my opinion, all presenting really, really fascinating topics. Um, though I'm gonna hold you in a little bit of suspense for just a tiny little bit. Um, before we start, I'd like to sort of extend a sincere thank you to Rethink Ireland, who have kindly supported this week-long event. Wild Acres Week is presented by Greensod Ireland and is designed by myself and my colleague Michelle Teig to celebrate our natural environment and all its biodiversity. Over the course of the week, we have brought together scientists, artists, environmentalists, young activists and generally concerned citizens to share their insights and knowledge of biodiversity and to hopefully inspire us to all get involved and indeed play some role in protecting the natural environment and all its wonderful biodiversity. So again, that for us, particularly at Green Sod, includes all the tiny little creatures like the earthworm, the wood lice, um, and all those lovely little soil creatures. So um, today we have, as I said, four really, really exciting and fantastic panelists. Um, but before we go into the talks, I know some of you have been, thank, thank you very much for coming to a number of our talks. So you know, maybe know the drill by now. I'm gonna invite you please to just type into the, type, to the chat box whereabouts you're tuning in from. We'd love to see whereabouts in Ireland or the world you're coming from. So anyone who doesn't know where the chat box is, you should find it just down on the bottom part of your screen. So. And I would also like to invite you um, to maybe just answer that question because tonight is all about that question. What does a healthy environment look like? So I'd love to know some of your thoughts. To you, what might a healthy environment look like? So please don't be shy. We have people from England, Wiltshire, Oxford, Galway, Dublin, Sligo, it's fantastic. Before we start as well, just some of you may be aware that um, at the beginning of the program, we had a wonderful project called the Wild Postcard Project. There are two scientists and artists who've developed this project called Wild Postcard Project, and they they work with children and teenagers um, all around the world doing basically um, art related activities around biodiversity in different countries. So they've created for us this pop up event that they're inviting anyone and everybody if you want to um, submit a drawing, a painting, a little sketch of something that re represents Irish biodiversity for you. So again, if you know anyone um, of any age that would like to participate, it finishes on uh, Sunday, which is the 13th of June. You might see their email down here. Again, you can find this information on the Green Sod um, Facebook page. If you send it to wildpostcardproject at gmail.com, one of them is going to be turned into an actual real postcard. Um, that you will be sent. So again, just to let you know, there's that little pop-up event that we'd love you all to get involved in. So our first speaker tonight is um, a lady from Canada. Her name is Amanda McKnight. Uh, she is what she would describe as a non-formal external facilitator. She works um, with us here at Greensod Ireland. In her own words, she describes herself as a facilitator where Mother Earth and wellness intersect. Her personal intent for working with Greensod Ireland is to encourage young people to navigate through larger community issues, such as eco-anxiety, climate action, social and environmental injustice. During her presentation, you will hear Amanda describe the workshop she designed and delivered to transition year students, which focused on developing new access points to building relationships in nature. Amanda will also invite you during the presentation to apply your own curious thinking to determine how can we create accessible words that people can apply to their lived experience in nature to connect deeper to ourselves and the earth. Amanda is actually in Canada at the moment. She had to go over due to COVID reasons. So she has sent us a video. Hello, my name is Amanda McKnight and I work with Green South Ireland as a non-formal external facilitator. And today I'm going to talk to you about creating new access points to build a relationship with nature. 
So I'm the green logo that you can see at the top that says Gardener, and I identify as a facilitator where Mother Earth and wellness intersect. I have a background in the healing arts, regenerative gardening, activism, and herbalism, to name a few, and I access all of these umbrellas to inform my work. During the last year, I designed a two-hour workshop called New Normal to facilitate two TYs on behalf of Greensod Ireland. New Normal being the coin phrase used to capture the last year, but does it capture your experience? And what feelings does this phrase encompass for you? For many TYs, reflecting on this term brought up feelings of annoyance, futility, and anxiety, making it clear that it's a loaded term, which points to the fact that intentional words are important which is something we unpack in my workshop. How can we create accessible words that people can apply to their lived experience in nature? Intentional words can cross over to indicate why people do or do not invest in building relationships to nature. So I opened my workshop by asking TYs to anonymously answer, do you feel that you have a relationship with nature? And displayed on the screen, you can see the results to this question. On the left, you can see the cluster that responded with, yes, they do feel that they have a relationship with nature, while on the right shows the cluster that responded with no. Many people discuss that they have a hard time identifying plants in their surroundings, some to the extent that when asked to imagine a plant, they could not hold an image of one in their mind. It seems that the participants who chose to share were trying to connect this question to plants first, not to other parts of biodiversity. And in Ireland, we have a lot of natural diversity. And for others who chose to share, it was the choice word of relationship that made it unapproachable to fathom how relationships connect to nature. So through my previous youth development work, I have observed that the heaviest and sometimes trickiest themes that young people are navigating relate to relationships and the environment, which generally young people, as well as many other age demographics, tend to view both as two separate spheres. In my work, I aim to bridge the two together to demonstrate that there are many linked connections between the relationship we have with ourselves and the relationship that we have with nature, and that one can inform and learn from the other. Now, of course, this heavy themes list has expanded to include the awareness of the felt fragment fragmentation of living in a pandemic. All of these spheres can overlap on the element of change. When something needs to change, we need to reimagine it. If people are not able to see connections between relationships and nature, there poses a need to develop new ways or access points to approach each sphere with togetherness. In my workshop, I drew parallels to all these spheres of change and how each can be measured, offset, or act as signals towards the other at the points where they intersect. And just to mention that this workshop did generate data, but because I'm still in the process of analyzing it as I wish to use it to inform a further project that I am aiming to develop, I'm going to take the time now to talk through the processes applied to the project rather than the outcomes. I encourage you to apply your own curious thinking to determine if you feel that through this brief presentation, if there's a space and or need for emotions to enter into the conversations as they relate to nature, to aid in shifting how we see and interact with the world. So there's a term called eco-paralysis, which on the surface can appear as inaction toward env environmental crisis. Sometimes when there's too much continual change, it can feel overwhelming, which might present as apathetic or an inability to respond and act. A lot of times this behavior gets confused with laziness or ignorance, which in itself holds elements of guilt and shame. Based on our understanding of both of those emotions, guilt and shame, does this emotion provoke positive action? So if the conversation is about encouraging someone to participate, do you think making them feel guilty or shaming them is an appropriate call to action in relation to building a deeper relationship with nature? And you can take that term and dig a bit deeper um, because it's possible to connect eco paralysis with the behaviors relating to procrastination. So procrastination too presents as laziness and both are habitual processes that tend to get vilified because they do not fit in someone else's mindset. It's valuable to recognize that both eco paralysis and procrastination call back to the same emotion, fear. Rather than demanding that someone gets involved by uh, responding in action to do their part, 
what can we do to ensure that a person who perhaps is uncertain or overwhelmed about how to get involved feels supported so that they can define their own why by choosing to participate in nature in a way that feels safe and fulfilling for them. Language can be divisive. It can be abused to instill fear. Jargon can be inaccessible and dialects may not reflect your own experiences. On the other hand, developing new language that encompasses emotions can invite participation. It can help to reimagine new solutions and promote change and it can reconnect us to lost connections and transmute fear. Emotional language, rather than segregating people further, can bring people back together by making meaning from change, communicating it with our emotions, and applying empathy and curiosity to extend to those that journey through change in a different way from ourselves. There is also value in taking time to listen and learn before we act, act react and respond. This can help us to avoid rash reactions like canceling people or ideas. Looking behind what might be stopping someone from getting involved in conversations or action rather than assuming it's because they do not care can help us to figure out better ways of reaching out so that we can connect. We can open up more conversations with others who may have opposing views by listening and learning from each other rather than dismissing their experience because it doesn't fit with ours. Emotional language and activism can be very valuable. When we are emotionally invested, we are more likely to respond in positive action. So thinking back to the question I opened my TY workshop with, do you feel that you have a relationship with nature? Relationships are all about healthy and strong foundations. Relationships involve empathy and understanding. Relationships rely on communication. Therefore, how would the depth of our conversations around the natural landscapes change when we include our own feelings and where we stand in it? Emotions are informative. So do you feel that they have a valid place in the conversation on the ground regarding the climate crisis? And I want to leave you with something to reflect on. So I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds here to consider a question I will ask you. You can write it down or hold it in your mind and just kind of put down the first word that comes to your mind when you hear the question. What is one feeling word that you would use to describe your relationship to nature at this very point in time? So just write down one feeling word and I'm going to give you about 30 seconds. Okay, looking at this word, is this the same word that you would use to describe the relationships that you have with others or with yourself? So how does your relationship with nature reflect the other relationships that you have in your life? Language helps shape who we are and how we view the world. And that's the end of my presentation. So thank you for listening. Um, it wasn't possible for me to do this live with you today, but please feel free to connect with me through email if you would like to connect with me or my work further. Thank you. If anyone would like to share their feeling word, please feel free to put so in the chat. Um, just an invitation, you don't have to, but I'm sure Amanda would um, love to, to know if anyone had one. I know my one at the moment is love, love nature. I'm not sure how that if that responds to everyone in my in, in, in around me, but um, that's my word there. So if anyone else would like to share theirs, please do. Um, I don't know about you. I find that very very fascinating. Um, our next speaker then is Dr. Maria Long. She is, works with the National Parks and Wildlife Service as a grassland ecologist. Um, I first met Maria some years ago and at the time she was working with tiny, tiny microscopic snails and I found um, her passion for ecology and the way she talked really enthralling. So I know we're in for a treat. 
Um, her remit as a grassland ecologist includes providing scientific advice on the conservation of grasslands, as well as oversight of survey, monitoring, managing and uh, designation of, for these habitats. She also aims to raise awareness, um, a public awareness of the value of semi-national grasslands. So today, Maria will be introducing us to Ireland's semi-national uh, natural grasslands which because they are not, not agriculturally improved can be apparently very species rich, supporting an abundance of biodiversity um, both above and below ground. Apparently these grasslands are also often hidden in plain sight, which members of the public like yourself and I are largely unaware of their existence, their importance, and also their vulnerability. So Maria, thank you very much for joining us today. Great. Now let me share my screen and I shall say hi then and you girls, uh, Ashley you can pipe up if uh, in a moment and let me know that if, if all isn't well. Do. Now so that's my first slide and that's my second one. All looks good. Okie dokie. So thank you so much guys for uh, the in invitation to come and speak to you guys about semi-natural grasslands. They really are precious resources, they're under threat, and hopefully I'll just give a little, little bit of an introduction to semi-natural grasslands in Ireland. And I work for the National Parks and Wildlife Service, as Ashley said, the NPWS, uh, as the grassland ecologist. But I've worked as an ecologist working on lots of different things over the years. Uh, my Twitter handle I just put up there, at grasslands IRL, if anybody wants to, to get in touch on Twitter, no problem, for grassland news. So today, look, we'll take a little, little quick tour. Uh, what are semi-natural grasslands and why are they important? Are they under threat? What are the top tips for management? And what can you do with a, a bit of a special mix uh, or a, a comment on wildflower mixes? Because it's a real kind of hot topic at the moment. OK, so I often start with terminology because it's useful if we're all singing off the same hymn sheet. Um, I'm just going to move my, the images now from the side of my screen. There we go. Um, so I want to say that natural grasslands, they exist for sure, obviously, but they exist elsewhere in the world. We don't have natural grasslands in Ireland, and I'll explain why. Uh, in terms of natural grasslands, think of the prairies of North America, savannas of Africa. These are large open expanses where grasses are the main plants. So grassland is simply defined, uh, defined by grasses being the main plants, water than woody things like, like trees and shrubs and bushes. So elsewhere in the world, we have large areas that are dominated by grasses. They tend to be arid, so very dry, maybe cold, maybe have a fire regime, so fires passing through quickly. They're fairly little altered by man. This isn't the case in Ireland. Ireland is a, a landscape that's altered by man. We do have a climate and we do have the situation that would support lots of tree growth if man wasn't here, but we are and we're here a long time. So what we have in Ireland is we have semi-natural grasslands, which is our focus today, and we have improved grasslands. So improved grasslands, I've improved like in, a, in little inverted commas, have been improved for agriculture or maybe amenity. Your lawn might be an example of an improved grassland or a golf course would for sure. Uh, these are highly modified. But our focus today and my, and my focus is on these semi-natural grasslands. They've been uh, created by man thousands of years ago when man first arrived on this island and started to clear the forests. So they've been created many thousands of years ago and there's a suite of species that exist in them that are adapted to living in those habitats. Low intensity management, but management nonetheless. And just in terms of the, the, the impact and the importance of management, it's quite interesting to think of a, a spectrum of management options for somebody who's managing land. So the upper photo and the upper text represents intensive agriculture, where you're going to have some of all, some or all of the following actions. There might be ploughing and reseeding, almost certainly in that upper photograph there. Definitely lots of fertiliser going on that field. High stocking rates if it's a, if it's a grazing situation or a dairy situation. Probably chemicals to, to manage the pests, again in inverted commas, possibly boundary removal so that farm machinery can move around more easily. So these are the characteristics of intensive agriculture. Some or all of those activities will happen. And at the other end of the spectrum, in terms of how land is managed, you have extensive farming, so opposite to intensive. And at that end of the spectrum, you typically won't have ploughing. So look at the photo on the right hand side that has so many different plant species that won't have been ploughed and reseeded. I can tell by looking at it. It'll get little, little fertilizer, maybe none. There'd be low stocking densities or moderate, very little chemical use. So look, these are, are, are uh, cues that I see because this is what I do for a living. I can uh, tell about the management. I can tell by what plant species and the communities are there, what the management is like. Lots of our grasslands exist in various places along the spectrum, but it's very useful to think about what type of management is applied to a land. What does it result in? 
and you might think well look how much does it matter like it's all plants uh, what's what's the story how much does it matter and look it really does matter the intensity of the, the management so in a typical improved agricultural field so if it's managed for silage for dairy for example you're only going to have one or two plant species dominating that sward often perennial ryegrass it's probably the most common plant in ireland because it's reseeded into into agricultural fields There'll be a handful of other species found, species that cope well in these high nutrient situations like docks and thistles and nettles. So agricultural production will be very high in these types of fields and that's important. We have to feed human beings so we do need some areas that are um, prioritised for agricultural production, but other services that the land can provide for us and that habitats and species can provide uh, will be quite low in a situation like that. And in a semi-natural grassland, you're going to have much higher diversity, more species, different types of structure. The plants are different shapes, sizes. Some of them are clumped. Some of them are tall and skinny. Some of them are low growing. The soil is going to be vastly different. Way more diversity in the soil of microbes, of fungi. The soil structure itself is going to be different. If, for example, you can have over 40 species of plant in a two by two meter area in a nice semi-natural grassland. You might have only one or two in an equivalent area in, in the upper situation. So the difference is vast in terms of diversity. And that diversity brings resilience. If you have more species with more traits, more ways of growing, more sizes and shapes and ways of being, it confers a resilience on systems. So if we have more droughts in the future, some of those species in the diverse sward will be better able to cope with droughts. We have very little resilience in an improved agriculture situation. All our eggs are in one basket, so to speak. Um, I just said I'd flick this up. I won't go through everything here, but just to think about some of the, the ecosystem services that are performed by semi-natural grasslands. So what good are they is another, uh, another question I could put up here. Well, of course, they provide food for domestic stock. So if we put out our cattle, they get to feed in, the, in a semi-natural grassland. Uh, it might not have as much biomass, but they will still get feed and they'll possibly get healthier feed because they'll have a mix of plant species that they're eating. And they can choose which species to eat at different times. And, and so they do. But also there's going to be food in there, much more and more appropriate food for a range of other wild animals. For example, pollinators, very little to no food for pollinators in a reseeded sward that has just one or two species in it. Uh, carbon sequestration, I'll jump to that one. Um, grasslands are often overlooked in terms of carbon sequestration and carbon storage. Some grasslands are hugely important uh, and they can store a lot of um, carbon and they can sequester it, particularly wet grasslands, floodplain grasslands along our major rivers and lakes. Uh, it's now thought that some of those grasslands can store as much and perhaps more than some types of woodland. So grasslands have been a little overlooked in terms of their ability to, to sequester and store car uh, carbon. I'm going to jump right down to the end and talk a little bit about a heritage and, and sense of well-being. Even now that in Ireland, many of us live in towns and cities, we still self-identify massively with an agricultural and a rural heritage. We take pride in the 40 shades of green in Ireland. We really do identify strongly with the natural world around us and in terms of how we, uh, you know, the, how, how we uh, experience well-being and, and, and express our, our heritage and our culture. However, an awful lot of people don't quite realise that walking through a grassland, for example, like the one in the photograph there in the foreground of a species rich grassland, it's intensely more enjoyable than walking through an improved agricultural sward. There's so much more to experience, to smell, to hear and to see. And yet many people wouldn't necessarily think it through the different types of grasslands and the sense of well-being that we get from them. So that's definitely worth considering. OK, are our semi-natural grasslands under threat? Uh, spoiler alert, yes they are. Um, I'm just going to mention two surveys very quickly. Uh, these are um, national grassland surveys that have taken place in Ireland. They were roughly six years apart, these surveys, and you can see the dates. This isn't historical data, this is recent information in the last two decades. They looked at a subset of really, really special grassland types that are rare on a European level, not even just in Ireland. So for the calcareous grasslands that they looked at, 30% of them were gone. In that six-year period, just in the last couple of decades. Um, another very special grassland type called Millennia Meadows, 7% were gone. And for our hay meadows, similarly, almost 30% gone. So it's not that the surveyors went back and saw a small change. The grasslands were gone. They'd completely, they completely changed in terms of the plant species growing there. They were either plowed or forested or had just completely changed. And these figures are alarming, but unfortunately, they're probably underestimates because the, the second survey went back to the best of the best sites, these really special grassland types. If we surveyed semi-natural grasslands more broadly, the, the losses in the wider countryside could actually be higher, which is alarming. 
what are the threats that are causing these losses? Two main threats, and they're almost the opposite so sides of a coin. So we've habitat loss due to intensive agriculture. So somebody decides to plow up a field. We still, our, our agriculture system still incentivizes um, production. So the farmers are still incentivized uh, via policy and uh, by the way things are set up to, intens to intensify their farming. Also forestry, increasingly people well-meaning or otherwise are planting often inappropriate um, trees in inappropriate places and it's becoming one of the biggest threats to semi-natural grasslands. On the other side of the coin, abandonment where people stop farming. So this is less dramatic and less immediate in its effect but it applies to absolutely huge areas and grasslands must be managed. So abandonment is also a massive threat and it can be very hard to come back from it. So I guess the key message is that semi-natural grasslands, they need the management, but it needs to be appropriate. If you move into intensive agricultural management, that isn't, uh, that isn't gonna help, it isn't appropriate. Very quickly, there often is more data in the UK. There are more people doing this type of work and so they often can tell a story a little clearer. Um, I'm keeping an eye on my time now better speed up. Um, in the UK, they've lost, they know that they've lost 97% of their meadows since the 1930s. We will have lost a very similar proportion. I don't know the figure. Our losses will have happened more recently, but we will have had a very similar loss. And I'll just mention this very quickly. They can see in the UK that they're losing a species going extinct at about the rate of one species per county per year in the UK. These are grassland plant species. So it is quite horrifying what we're losing. And I'll also just flick this up quickly because I'm running out of time. Most of you will be familiar with the sad story of the corn crake. There's a new project just started. If you uh, go to corncrakelife.ie, you can find out about it. We're losing other birds too. The corn bunting has been lost twice, breeding curlew and lapwing, all decreases of over 90%. So we're losing a lot by um, these changes that have occurred in, our, in our, the way we farm. And it isn't about blaming farmers, but it's about thinking, what can we tweak? Can we support some parts of our land to also support nature as well as supporting less intensive farming? Um, I'm going to very quickly mention this. Uh, if you want to manage semi-natural grasslands well, you want to reduce or stop your nutrient inputs and you want to um, keep your stocking, stocking rates fairly low to moderate. Traditional breeds are fantastic. And skip to the very bottom, don't reseed. If you reseed, you've, you've lost everything because you've completely changed the plants that are found. But I guess most of you on, the call, on, on this call are not farmers, so what can you do? Maybe you could manage uh, any plants or any land that you have in your control, your garden, your pot plants, manage those better or with nature in mind. So I'll mention wildflower seed mixes. Value semi-natural habitats and let land managers know. Speak up in tidy towns groups and community groups. Let's make more conscious choices maybe. Tell everyone you know that semi-natural grasslands are great. And tell everyone you know to think twice before tree planting. Trees are amazing but only if they're planted in the right place, not at the cost of another valuable habitat. So very quickly, um, recently, because I think this is very important, I put the phrase wildflower meadows just a month or two into Google, and these are the images that showed up. These are the first images, and it kind of breaks my heart that most of these are actually horticultural flowers. They're nothing to do with wildflower meadows. The two that are circled are wildflower meadows. So we've kind of lost control uh, of the term, and we've, we've uh, changed what people's expectations are. A meadow is a grassy place and it should have wild native species in it, like the one in the main photograph here. Horticultural planting should be limited to gardens and urban spaces. Non-local and non-native seed ends up contaminating and maybe irreversibly damaging our really precious and rare semi-natural grassland. It's a big, big issue that we didn't foresee a few years ago. Um, so we really do need to recalibrate and change our expectations. This uh, image might not be as appealing as your big showy flowers, but it's infinitely more valuable to biodiversity. Take home messages, we have amazing grasslands. Some of them are in Great Pearl. We do have solutions at hand, awareness raising, education and discussion. That's what I'm trying to do about uh, just opening people's eyes a little bit to grasslands. They're all in front of us. We're world leaders in Ireland in trying to support farmers to um, farm for nature, but it's still too small. Even though we're world leaders in this field, the mainstream of farming is still aiming too much at production to, to my mind. And I think I better wrap up there. Thank you very much for your time. And sure, we can take questions afterwards if people have questions. I don't know about anyone else. I've, I have a million questions <laughs> to say. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I, I mean, I was listening to every word you said, but the thing that really struck in my head is you were saying really that over 
60%, if not a lot more of grasslands is, is, is lost. And that's, that's shocking. Um, but uh, thank you so much, May. That was really, really informative. And I, and I love the practical elements that you've given us some take home, you know, things to take home. Um, so next up, we have Dr. Karen Bacon, who is a lecturer in plant ecology and in botany and plant science in NUI Galway. And um, for Karen's talk, we ask the question, how plant aware are you? Karen researches uh, research spans modern plant ecology with interest in extinction risk, invasive species and ecology, in paleoecology and further interest in plant responses to mass extinctions, fossil preservation and ecochemistry. She is also interested in how people engage with plants and in botanical education. So today, Karen is going to talk to us about her research into plant blindness. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Ashley. Um, let's try and share my screen now. Let's see how we get on. So hopefully um, we can see this. Okay. So I hope that's sharing now. Um, <clears throat> So what, uh, as Ashley said, what I want to talk to you today about is just how people actually think about plants, how they notice them, how they engage with them. Um, and the term that is sometimes used for this is uh, plant blindness, but I want to kind of think about it in a different way. And that's why I'm asking the question of how plant aware are you? So just to kind of give a little bit of background on the, the general reason for this and, and the reason that we're interested in this topic is that many people think about plants as background. They don't, if you show people a picture that has an animal in it and ask them, what is the picture of? They won't tell you about the grassland. They won't tell you about the forest. They'll tell you about the animal. I do this with students every year. And every year I get told about birds and mammals and um, and dragonflies or bees, they, they, and these are my botany students, they, they often don't see the, the plants. Um, and they're tuned in to the plants as well. So when you go and talk to the general public, you're even less likely to have people see the plants. This is where people basically then, they, they're not, not that they're not interested, but sometimes they're not interested. And many people are not even able to identify even common species of plants. And this is a form of cognitive bias. So this is our brains not really fully turning on and engaging with plants. And a term that's been around since the late 90s is plant blindness. And it defines it as the inability to see or notice plants in one's environment, to recognize their importance, to appreciate their biological features, and also to consider them inferior to animals. And this was developed by uh, some American educators back in um, the 1990s. But what myself and colleagues who are working on this want to do is try and flip that around a little bit, because everybody does know about plants. You can tell me quite a lot about plants if I don't scare you away and ask you immediately, what is this one? Um, and everyone can tell me about, you know, different kinds of plants that they like. Most people will recognize the plants behind me in my screen view as daffodils. Um, people will tell you about, you know, food and, you know, what spices they like or, you know, a favorite brand of vegetable or any of these things. People know a lot about plants, but they just don't really think that they do and they don't think about it. So what we're interested in knowing is what do you recognize? And starting the conversation there rather than kind of saying what do you not know so we're interested in kind of changing the conversation a little bit but to highlight this you probably all know what this is most of you will know what this is you might know what this one is that one maybe maybe not this one i think most people will know i think everyone probably knows this one but that could just be it's one of my favorite animals and um, most people will know this you're going to know this one too and you may or may not know this one, but I would be very confident to say that the vast majority of people on this call can recognize probably most of the animals that I've put up. Now, as I put up the next screen, now I do this as a test with my students, but I'm not going to test anyone today. But see if you recognize the same proportion of the plants that I'm going to put up now. So do you know this? This one? How about this? this one, 
What about this? This one. What about this? And this. This one. Or this one. You all probably recognize at least one or two of these plants. You might not know their scientific name, but that's not what we're interested in. Just do you know what these plants are? And myself and colleagues have done this test with our students. We've done it with the general public, and we've even put some of our colleagues on the line as well. And we've had very varying results from people who can identify maybe one or two to uh, people who can identify all of them. They're, they're usually the professionals um, or one or two extremely keen um, gardeners maybe are able to, to do this too. But do you recognize all of them? So don't worry about their names. Do you recognize all of them? You may or you may not. Some of these are more common in different parts of the country. Some of them are more common uh, in the UK where I initially um, developed this um, the tests that we do with, with students and with people. But it's important to know that you recognize some of them because that's kind of the first step towards thinking, actually, I do know a little bit more about plants than I thought I did. And if you don't, that's okay too. But why does it matter? Who cares? Why do we care whether people can recognize plants or not? And my counter argument to that is, why does it not matter? Can you tell me any major global challenge today that when you dig into it, when you think about it, does not relate to plants? So this is hugely problematic. People not engaging with plants is problematic because uh, you are less inclined to care about something that you, you don't know about. You're less inclined to engage with things to try and help protect plants if you just don't think about them. And these major global challenges that we think of thinking about food security, water quality, climate change, the biodiversity crisis, which I'm going to pick up on in a minute. All of these require us to understand and engage with plants and it requires all of these are also political and I'm not going to go into the politics of it, but it requires people to care in order to make decision makers care. And if people don't know anything about it or just don't think about it, then they're not gonna say, well, maybe we should be thinking about protecting this area of grassland. Maybe we shouldn't you know, put an apartment block there. Um, things like this are really important and it's important that people are engaged with the natural world. There's also more and more evidence every year as people start to study the mental health benefits and the wellness benefits of plants as well. Um, and I'm sure most people have had the experience of going out for a walk to clear your head and you feel better when you've been out in nature. Um, and this is something that is being a little bit more recognized and being a little bit more thought about. And we've certainly heard an awful lot about the benefits of nature in the last 18 months or so as people are being encouraged to you know, go for a walk locally and, and these kinds of things. So it has these benefits as well. So in terms of the the big problems. Uh, one of the ones that I'm most interested in is the biodiversity crisis. So this is where we are seeing increasing numbers of species decline or go extinct. And Maria has also said this quite clearly in her talk um, about the decline of, of certain species in grasslands. It's not just in grasslands, it's across the board. And for plants, this is new. So I could tell you lots about extinction in the fossil record but that's not what I'm here to talk about today um, and one of the things that is recognized and increasingly recognized today is that over 40 percent of plants globally sorry nearly 40 percent not over nearly 40 percent of plants globally are considered to be threatened potentially a risk of extinction and that is absolutely huge and if we were to look at the fossil record when there have been uh, natural mass extinctions those kind of numbers are not reached for plants. So this is really problematic. So this is new and it's a different problem. And when we look at the root causes of these threats, we see things like human disturbance, pollution, um, changes to natural ecosystems, land use change. These kind of things are where we're, start, we're seeing the real push and the real pressure on plants. And this is hugely problematic. Because if we start to really lose these kind of numbers of plants, then we're going to start to see the ecosystems have, have suffer and have a real problem. And as Maria also said, 
when you have a more diverse ecosystem, you have a more resilient ecosystem as well. So when we start to lose species, then the ecosystems start to suffer as well. And ultimately, we all live in terrestrial environments, so we do need them to work. So if we think about um, a, a mass extinction, which is what many scientists are worried that we're either in the beginning of or close to entering, that looks at a, a roughly a 70 percent extinction level of species. So if I put these two photographs back up and say, what does that look like? It looks like this. And with the plants, it looks like this. So these are big changes, big losses, catastrophic losses to how our ecosystems function. So this is obviously one of the reasons that, you know, I'm very passionate about trying to get people to care about the environment and to care about plants, because if we look after the plants, in many ways, everything else gets looked after because of that, because the plants are at the ground level. They are the, the foundation of the ecosystems. Um, so the plants are really, really important and they are so often an afterthought. But for this particular session, uh, thinking about the, the title of what does a healthy ecosystem look like? I thought that was really interesting because you can look out at a landscape and think it looks fine if you don't know about plants. So this looks lovely. It's lush, it's green. There are some beautiful purpley pink flowers in there. It looks lovely here as well. It's, it's bordering this nice bit of grassland and it looks beautiful. It's not, <laughs> this is a huge problem. And when you go into that beautiful pink bush, this is what you see. There's nothing else in there. This is rhododendron and this is an invasive species. And if you look at this and just think what a beautiful landscape, you're missing the damage that it's doing. Nothing else is growing under there. This is not a healthy ecosystem. And there's no, nothing like this. No saplings of oaks, no regeneration in areas where it's starting to dominate. So this is the other reason to me that it is critical to understand, to look at plants and go, this is what we should have here. This is a diverse, robust, resilient ecosystem. And looking at something that even though it can look beautiful, is not a strong ecosystem and is a problematic species. So it is not just a case of looking out and going, there's loads of plants there, that's fine. It's not always the case. So just because something looks nice and looks like there's a lot of plant there doesn't mean that what we're actually seeing is a healthy environment for our plants and animals. So plants are essentially, in, to my mind, immeasurably important. And we do often forget about them. And they're often consigned to the background or they're only considered important when we can put a specific service on them. So, you know, it's not, it's not just the things plants can do for us. It's also the things that plants are the ecosystem. Without plants, we are going to be in a very bad way. And if we're looking at close to 40% of plants being threatened, that is troubling on a, a really immense scale. So we need to engage with plants. We need to be plant aware. And I think that it's important to understand just the critical importance of plants. And I think all of us probably need to try and be a little bit more plant aware. So thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, so we've got, without trying to sound depressing, we have over 60% of our grasslands got, um, in danger and we have over 40% of our plants, which um, I love the, your term there, plant aware, which is true. I think we, we, we forget, I think um, it's many years ago, it's, it was a knowledge that everyone had. We were much more aware of everything around us from, from how the weather was changing to the um, animals, to the plants. And it's, and it's things that we, we really, I think since the digital age have really separated ourselves from. And I think now is the time that we really need to, as you said, become plant aware. Um, I think we should print t-shirts actually, plant, plant awareness, I think is a wonderful term. So thank you so much for that, really interesting. I've, again, if anyone has any questions, um, please be noting them down or drop them into the chat box. Um, 
So my next speaker is a wonderful artist who I had the privilege of sharing um, an art studio some years ago, Ida Matrani. And um, Ida is also going to talk to us a little bit about plant blindness. She completed um, a master's in art and process in Crawford Art College in Cork. She, her, she's an amazing um, botanical artist and her, at the moment, her concern as well is in influenced by the concept and theories of plant culture, including plant blindness and hybrid materials. Ida's end of year exhibition was the result of a year long research project that looked at the rate, the relationship and the intersection between humans, plants and technology, whilst also looking at the function between uh, weeds and today's society. So I've invited Ida to join us today. She's going to talk to us about her arts practice and in particular her most recent research uh, that she developed during her MA. So thank you for joining us, Ida. Thanks, Ashley, and uh, thank you both uh, yourself and Misha for inviting me. So uh, I'm just going to share my screen now. Can you all see okay? Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so um, I, I'm just going to read a, a section of my statement. So my artistic concerns and interests are influenced by concepts and theories of plant culture in the current environmental crisis, including plant blindness, post-naturalism and hybrid material. The creative process explores the relationship and the interaction between humans, plants and technology and looks at the function and meaning of weeds in today's society. So, um, yeah, my appreciation of color led me to the concept of plant blindness. I um, I don't have a, a background in botany or uh, but or I I never knew much about plants. However, uh, over the the last uh, twenty years or all my life, I was always fascinated by uh, by colors, and uh, I just kept working on color charts. And I also teach art, and I always push my students to create those color charts. And uh, creating color charts is a perfect way to get familiar with um, and to notice the colors in nature that are uh, surrounding us. And when it comes to plant blindness, uh, another uh, Thing, uh, about plant blindness is we we see uh, plants are just being the, the color greens. However, if you if you notice if you pay attention and by creating all those different uh, greens, for example, you start seeing and noticing all the different greens, meaning that you will notice the, the different plants uh, around us. And it's not just green. You know you can do that with greys and all different colors. Uh, so uh, this this is how I started my research. Um, I um, I collected leaves with uh, various greens and shapes and displaced them into plastic pockets to uh, highlight their individual characteristics. But, but I, I realized that I was also highlighting the current environmental crisis, where non-biodegradable components are part of the natural environment. Um, and that brought me closer to notions of uh, social ecology, um, especially looking at uh, social ecologist uh, Murray Bookchin, and uh, where human relationships and behavior with each other are also reflected in uh, nature. So um, I was thinking of you know, nature and the different layers and how I could translate that into my own artwork. And, so I spent the whole year looking at what I already had around and I didn't want to spend any money at all buying new materials. So um, what I did is I, uh, I, I created digital images in Photoshop by scanning drawings combined with collage 3D materials uh, made out of uh, plastic and uh, I used also my own facial features. I used real hair. Um, and then on the right here, you can see uh, cutouts and use of paper and again, different materials. So um, the, the, the inclusion of the, the eye is quite symbolic for me and represent nature as an observer. Uh, so by including uh, anthropomorphic species, I'm questioning and, uh, the connection and relationships between humans and, and, and plants. 
um, here. So I use that imagery to create my own drawings. Uh, so I added different uh, materials and textures, including plant-like forms, again, my own hair, and I uh, created the plastic leaves uh, uh, by using plastic bottles. And uh, I've stitched everything on, the, on paper. Now, so uh, I've created a whole series of uh, digitized uh, images, and actually some of them are um, uh, exhibited in uh, Visual Carlo as part of an exhibition called uh, Women in the Machine. So the, the digitized images consist of edited images of human body parts combined with plant life forms and uh, plastics. So again, I was looking at uh, Bookshin and uh, the danger and notion of anthropomorphism where humans are projecting their own behavior onto non-human lives. And uh, I was also looking at uh, early German literature and I came across uh, this amazing writer uh, who, who wrote a science fiction book called uh, Mountains, Oceans and Giants. And it's basically taking place in the 27th century. And uh, Dublin was questioning the catastrophic effect of the industrial progress on the environment uh, through phenomena encountered uh, at the time in German society and describes in his book, violences of uh, vegetal eroticism where humans, animals succumb to and are incorporated with plant matter. So, um, I'm just going to go through the, the different uh, images that I've created here. Uh, sorry, I just go back again. Um, so I, I um, also named um, on the, the digital prints using the Latin names, the Latin way of uh, naming plants. So I, uh, for example, I called one, one of them Ruminum plasticus and I put an X in front of them just to, uh, which means hybrid. And um, I was, uh, the, the, the images are also inspired by vintage uh, botanical illustration plates to highlight and present to the public the characteristics of possible new futuristic uh, species. Um, so just gonna jump, yeah. So um, <laughs> I uh, created uh, those uh, installations uh, using different materials and uh, everything, like the wall installation is uh, stitched on uh, Japanese uh, rice paper. Uh, so I wanted to reflect on the idea of man creating an illusion of power over nature and uh, on, to contrast between the decaying organics and the more enduring materials. And all that made me reflect on human's legacy on earth. Because uh, I was thinking if I, uh, well, whatever would be left in the artwork would be the, the plastic. And I will show you here some uh, close-ups. Um, everything else will disappear, but years and years later, 20 or I don't know how many years later, what would be left would be the, the, the plastic. And I, I thought that was quite significant. And also by showcasing weeds in my work, uh, I wanted to draw attention to the control and destruction of what are considered undesired species, seen as uh, enemies in competition with more aesthetical and, leg and uh, commercial valued species. Um, so I want also wanted to explore with space and emphasize the idea of human and plant movement their flexibility and their adaptability within new environments. Uh, I brought a sculptural quality to the work, which allowed me to examine further with the movement of plants and their adaptation to new environments and how they seem to merge with uh, non-organic materials. Uh, the floor installation here, I uh, created sculptural plant-like objects. I used uh, coffee capsules uh, connected to wires and combined with various materials. Some of them with a small round mirror to reflect the viewer's uh, image back to them. And again, that's echoing the eye uh, on the digital uh, image that you saw in uh, the previous slide. Um, the making of the work was quite physical and uh, rather than try to control the work, I had to learn to adapt to it and work along with it. Um, and the mixture and merging of organic and inorganic materials examines the idea of a new vision of a 
possible clean landscape. So I know a lot of people are going to scream now thinking, well, how would you consider plastic as being uh, clean, um, as being considered as clean landscape? And I'm just, I guess I'm just thinking of the idea of uh, the amount of plastic. I mean, plastic is an amazing invention, but we've got too much of it. And uh, plastic is everywhere. And as you know, at the bottom of the ocean, so what happened, the fish eat the plastic and we're eating the fish. So uh, how to use it in a more, in a better way. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's kind of a maybe dystopian vision I have of uh, our future landscape, but uh, how to make it more positive, basically. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is uh, for both, um, installation and all my drawings I uh, used an onion net just one onion net to stitch all the various components um, and uh, yeah so uh, along with my uh, art practice uh, so this is the whole uh, view uh, of the exhibition so along with my art practice I also worked on different projects uh, as part of the my masters and uh, so this is called the Theatre of Weeds, and it was part of Heritage Week in 2020. So uh, that took place in two green shoots in Glengarry, in West Cork. So I was involved in a project, in this project, and uh, so it's about celebrating garden weeds, their history, ecology, and their medicinal and gastronomic uh, benefits. The plants were showcased and displayed using the tradition of Victorian plant theatres. Participants uh, sampled food prepared using the garden weeds and engaged in tours of the garden, art workshops, and a series of uh, presentations on the story of weeds. Um, then, um, sorry, I just want to see. Oh, I don't have the image. Uh, I had an image of, uh, oh, see, sorry, here. Uh, do you see the two girls looking at the frame? Uh, the frame has a specific meaning within my research in plant blindness. So just as a frame can be used to highlight a painting, it can also be used as a guide to bring into focus plants that are usually less noticeable in our environment. So by placing frames in specific areas in the garden, the viewer is invited to become the observer of plants that would be otherwise overlooked. So basically the plants uh, becomes uh, artwork. So this is uh, my plant clinic workshop. Uh, so this is an, effect, an extension of my studio practice where participants can discuss their relationship with plants and uh, non-biodegradable and society's role in the current ecological crisis. So um, I've asked the participants to create images of uh, hybrid plants by selecting from color, texture and shape uh, cards that are designed using commercial paint shop color cards. Uh, the participants experience of and a response to the workshop uh, played an important role in the development of my studio practice and I was just thinking of uh, using the visitor uh, feedback to generate my own uh, images of uh, hybrid plants. So uh, there is a, an important educational aspect in working in such projects. Uh, so everyone is learning, the educator, the artist, the participants, and it, it is as if nature becomes a silent teacher with whom we interact and from whom we learn. Um, so I, I used, uh, I ran the plant clinic workshop, but this time I run it with, the, with my tutors and the, the, the college staff. And the idea was to subverting the teacher and student role. So before I came to college, I was a teacher and then I became a student and then my teachers became the student and it was, Basically, I was interested in observing how humans adapt to new situations and environments, just as do plants in their own environments. So um, through conversations around the themes raised above and a series of quick practical demonstration on accurate plant representation and color chart uh, preparation, the participant created their own hybrid plant on paper uh, using recycled uh, materials combined with pre-prepared uh, digitized images of human forms. So you can see here, I've asked each participant to send me uh, visuals um, of, of their faces, hands, and different body parts, and I created different plants. So the flowers you see on the top left are created with lips, 
And then on the leaves, you can see the eyes. And then on the right, you can see fingers. Uh, and then, uh, so uh, it's just uh, people having fun and creating their own plans. And actually the last one was, uh, that's a, a workshop that I ran uh, in the Lexicon Gallery in Dunleary uh, at the beginning of the year. So to finish, I wanted to finish with a quote by Murray Bookshing. Uh, the very notion of the domination of nature by man stems from the very real, sorry, the very real domination of human by human. So Bookchin understood that the mistreatment of nature, including all living forms, mirrors our society and the way humans treat each other. The domineering and manipulative attitude to each other implies that a similar behavior is being developed towards the natural world. The system where culture, class and gender are based on inequality and uh, the rejection of differences by implication treats nature as inferior. So uh, that's it. Thank you. Fascinating, Ida. Um, I haven't seen Ida's work for quite some time and I, that's amazing. So, so different from um, the work when we were in the studio together. Um, I really love your idea that I, the concept of a, of a future landscape. Um, and in one way, it really does rem remind me of, as you said, the oceans and in a sense, what what we're leaving behind and all that plastic. I think that, that that's a really interesting concept that what you have made is something in a sense that's ephemeral in a way that it will disappear. But again, what is left will be the man-made. Um, I also love that concept you have there, the thought of nature as the silent teacher. Um, and I think one of the things that myself and Michelle um, found was really interested in was that idea of um, learning from nature, learning from each other, and that idea of peer-to-peer -peer learning. So that idea of that exchange between the teacher and the student, the student and the teacher. And we feel that the conversations between artists, scientists, philosophers, general public is really, really important. Again, that we all have something to share and learn and offer. I um, also love that idea that the, the dominant, or the thought of dominance of, of nature, which is something that I think all our speakers have touched on in one way or another, whether it's about the, the services in which we, we feel nature is giving us. So that idea of humans dominating nature, um, and we can very clearly see that that dominating of nature is, is um, basically it is um, making nature disappear. And again, it is that question, what, what, what is going to be left? And um, nature will still, will still grow, but, but with that, we'll have left an awful lot, as you said, of plastic, um, we'll have lost an awful lot of species and plants. So there's, I, I, I don't know about everyone else, I'm sure there's lots of questions, um, but I, I really find it interesting how all speakers in very different ways really spoke about this relationship between humans and nature dominating um, and loss, which I, I think is really, really interesting in very different ways. Um, so again, if anyone has any, we're gonna open it up now um, to, to questions. So if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to put on your mic and, and speak, um, or you can put it in the chat box if you prefer. There is one or two questions that have come in already, so I might just start the ball rolling um, with one or two of them. So there was actually a comment. I'll start with a comment. Um, there was a comment here back when it was Amanda's first talk. Um, Empathy and a climate for action and change, invested and positive action, participation, guilt, shame, etc., are all words that express how citizens in San uh, Jose, which I think is in California, feel when we lose our parks space due to high rise development. Ireland is such a beautiful country, and my sister visits th th uh, 30 years ago, loved it. Um, and then there was a question that's from Lillianne. I think you're in California. So if you are welcome, thank you for joining us all the way from California. You asked then a question, um, which I think is posed to Maria. How do we in California uh, continue to support meadows, wildlands when we have drought and everything is dry? Hmm. Good question. Um, probably slightly outside my uh, geographical sphere of knowledge, so I may not give the best answer here. But um, I think 
it's not uh, yeah uh, so i'm not i'm not quite sure what the person means just because it's dry doesn't mean you have a problem for the grasslands um like i mentioned at the start where we have our best natural grasslands on the globe so outside of ireland are areas typically that are very arid or very cold where it's hard for trees to survive there isn't enough moisture or it's too cold grasses are hardy um so just being dry isn't a problem for grasses because they're uh, they're they're pretty adaptable. That's why we have grasses everywhere. That's why we choose them for hard wearing surfaces like football pitches and uh, golf courses and uh, our lawns, things like that. So um, I guess the same general rules apply. You want to work with what's there. You want to alter it as little as possible. You want to work with the native species that are present if it's already quite uh, a modified situation you might want to look at well find your next nearest kind of natural grassland what are the species that do well there what are the species that are already adapted to this dry climate um it's probably hard for me to say too much more that there's an awful lot of information that i don't have about that situation and even if i did i might not be the best person but i think yeah working with what's there um and what what naturally grows in that area is always going to be your best bet and grasses are tough so it being dry is a i bet there's grassland communities that are that are adapted to that thanks maria and then there's another question um can you recommend what plant seeds can be planted if wanting a wild meadow section hmm um i saw that question come in i and the the if there's a did the person say section yes so that means probably that they're talking about a garden situation um look the general rules apply anyway the general rules are you want to choose native species so species that naturally occur in the wild in ireland um and if even better you want to have the seed sourced locally so within ireland and even better in your province or in your county it's really hard to find that. If you go into any supermarket, any um, hardware shop, any garden center, there are packets of wildflower seeds masquerading as wildflower seeds, as native species. So you really have to get to be very savvy. The showier the flowers, the less likely they are to be native wildflowers. Because like I said, look, we have nice bright clovers and buttercups, but people see them as weeds. The things that are they're trying to catch your eye with, it's like, it's like anything in the shops, they, they put the, the brightest color wrapping paper on the sweets to catch the, the children's eyes. It's very similar with the wildflowers. The showier the flowers in the packet, the less likely they are to be, a, you know, a native wildflower mix. The best, best thing you can do, collect seed locally. Um, you know, it takes a bit of work, but if you go out September, maybe October, August, September, October, depending on the weather, depending on uh, when things are dry and when things have gone to seed, collect seed locally. Uh, and 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 put that in if you're looking at planting seed and even better again work with what's there see what comes up and live with uh, what you and learn to accept and to love what people often call weeds so your clovers your buttercups your dandelions your speedwells your eyebrights all of these species are what are all the rest of our uh, all of the invertebrates, all the pollinators, all the birds, they're adapted to feed on those, to live among those, to grow among those, to uh, the caterpillars lay their eggs on those plants, the, the butterflies, sorry, and hatch into caterpillars. So working with what's there is the best, collecting seed locally is the next best. And the other thing then, read your packaging carefully and don't be, don't be sucked in with the, the bright, shiny, uh, um, luminous colored flowers. They're better for an urban situation or a garden, a garden situation uh, if needs be. And I think, yeah, just leaving space for, for what's there to come back. Yeah. Thank you. There's a question, I think, for um, Ida here, which it's to do with, or it could be anyone actually really, but about weeds um, and doing your workshop. Did you have any, did you learn anything about, uh, what was the question exactly? Did you learn anything from working with, pe with the people in your workshops about their relationship with weeds? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, as usual, uh, people see them as uh, enemies, you know, are the undesired species, but uh, the what was really interesting in, uh, I mean, especially in the workshop in the two green shoots, um, people realized that, uh, especially with uh, dandelions, uh, dandelions, that uh, you can make drinks, you can... Uh, grill the, the little seeds, uh, you can, uh, there, there are so many things you can do and we were surrounded by, uh, with, uh, by those beautiful plants. 
And um, yeah, I think by also by uh, working with the plants when it comes to art and measuring them and uh, preparing the color charts and uh, just looking at them, observing them and people starting to have more and more respect for them and uh, as if they were getting more attached to them basically. I wonder then if it's that idea, um, the more you look, you study something, the more you appreciate it. And the fact that we've labeled weeds as something that's that that's that that's nasty in a sense. And here's all these other beautiful plants. But as you said, when you study something closely, you you become more at, attached and, and, and have a, more of a affinity to it. Absolutely, absolutely. Because I don't think it's enough just to, to look at plants. I think the you know, when, when you spend much more time, uh, like I said, measuring, touching also the textures and uh, preparing the color charts, uh, it's it really, you, yeah, you get more familiar with, uh, with the plant itself, so all respect. And there was one about um, plant and technology. Um, how does plant blindness and technology connect? And I think that's for uh, both either and or um, Ida and Ka Karen. How plant, uh, and plant blindness and technology connect. Yeah. Well, uh, I, for me, it's very important to use technology because, uh, you know, technology is, is everywhere. Um, and uh, again, by spending more time using technology, I created, I created those plants you know, the, all those little uh, those, uh, digital images. So um, this, is, this is how I, I see it, basically. Um, it's spending more time using different materials. Um, and uh, we, have, we all have access, I think most of us have access to technology and uh, it, it is um, quick to, to share that information. So um, I think, from there's kind of two there's two sides almost to it um, from a kind of a, a botany ecology perspective I guess and one is that um, there's not a tremendous amount of of research done um, in some ways in terms of of plant blindness but some research that has been done and basically it's more kind of nearly veering into anthropology as well um, is that societies that are um, further removed from technology and maybe more rural or more rural facing um, are better uh, engaged with the natural world. And I think that kind of stands to reason um, to a certain extent um, and maybe less plant blind, more plant aware. Um, but then I think the other side of it, so in, in some ways the kind of technology draws you away from the natural world, but it can also um, be part of the solution as well. So. Nowadays, most people, um, particularly in, in Western societies, have a smartphone um, in their pocket. It lets you take photographs very easily. And there's quite a lot of apps that can help you to try and identify things. Now, they come with a massive caveat. Um, and I have students looking at this, um, which is, do these apps, all, are they also plant blind? Um, and, and they are. Um, so if you have a photograph, for example, of a bee on a flower and actually a photograph that I have that I was going to show, but there wasn't enough time. Um, and if you put it through, say, Google Lens, even though the flower is clearly the focus of the photograph, the bee could be blurry. It's still going to identify the bee first and say, oh, you, you can't possibly have been interested in that plant. So this is just a terrible photograph of a bee. Um, and it'll give you the bee options first rather than looking at the um the plant there's also you know they're not terribly good at identifying plants um there's a bit of a geographic bias as well because most of them are developed in north america and they'll tell you that you've got you know a north american species of ash even though you're standing in ireland going it's definitely not the north american ash um so they're i think that they're as a kind of um giving you the right answer they're not great but in terms of helping you to maybe know, oh, look, that's, it's definitely an ash or it's a clover of some description. And it, it helps to give people some information and maybe get people more interested and then go, you know, if you want to really know what it is, you have to go a little bit further than, than what the apps offer. 
but I do think they offer a little bit of a window into the kind of the world of trying to identify plants which can feel vast um, and maybe a little bit intimidating. Um, so I think that they can potentially offer some of the solution to this as well, that it's, it's not going to give you the right answer all the time. Uh, some of the time it will. Um, I have a, a master's student trying to figure out exactly what percentage of the time uh, many of them will give you the right answer. Um, I'm thinking about maybe ways of trying to improve it or, you know, but I definitely think technology can be part of the solution as well. Um, I definitely. Interesting because I think you said it can be part of the solution, but not the solution. And I think that's something we're learning a lot more that we, we rely sometimes too much on yep. technology. When we spoke um, a few weeks ago, actually, you you did you showed us that picture of very, very clear, detailed plant and then a very mm. fuzzy insect. And yet the 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 app could identify that insect and not the plant, which to me was quite shocking. And then yeah. You know, because I, I, I'm, I was all delighted. I have downloaded a few um, plant apps now, and I'm like, this is great. And but now, it, it, again, it, it, it's made me much more aware that technology is a tool, but you still have to go back to other resources and double check your information, which is something. Um, yeah. Hopefully, we, we as a society are starting to realise that it's just a tool, not the answer. Thank you both for those questions. I see um, Thomas has his hand up there. Do you have a question? I have a point to Karen that she made about the people identifying the animals and not the plants. And it gave me a realization that I could sit here and I could probably name off 100 animals in their description. I'd struggle with 50 or 60 plants, and some of them would be just named from books. There wouldn't be. And we all know about the endangered animals. And you see people waving tins and saying, save the whatever animal. And you don't see anybody saying, save the this plant or that plant. And even to me, that would seem a bit strange. And I want to know, are the groups like that that are sort of growing these plants and you know reintroducing them to the wild? And if they are, is there a point to that? I.e., if I take these extinct Irish plants and plant them in my garden, will the very thing that made them extinct, well, obviously not extinct ones, but the very thing that made them endangered, wipe them out again? So that's a really good question. And um, there's huge conservation efforts um, by many of them are led by, um, you know, places like the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew. Um, the National Botanic Gardens here in Ireland have great programs going with um, seed collection to try and preserve our, our native species and all of these kind of things. And then there's the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which is a global organization that works on trying to assess the status of plants and animals, not, uh, not just one or the other, they do both, um, and trying to actually understand, because one of the, the real problems that we have is we still, like, first of all, we don't know how many species we have anyway. We have estimates, but we don't actually know all of the species. Um, then secondly, we have um, species that are, you know, very highly threatened, uh, critically endangered species. And these ones do have many of them, not all of them, but many of them will have conservation plans, depending on where they are, depending on funding that's available. Sadly, it always comes back to money. Um, there are conservation plans and actions in place. Um, it's really important and I think there's a, you know, for a long time in conservation, there's been more and more effort to make sure that conservation plans are done with local communities. Um, and I think that's something that's become more and more part of trying to preserve things. And particularly with plants, you can have, you'll have, if you have a small population that is considered critically endangered, that people are aware of and that are, they're actively trying to conserve, they will try and conserve it in the place where it is. And they'll also try and propagate it, um, usually through botanic gardens, maybe through research institutions, things like that, um, so that it's it's still there. It's it's also kind of being grown in an area maybe where it doesn't have whatever the specific threats are. What we tend to find is that it's not one thing. So it's not you know just one thing usually with plants and animals, but particularly with plants, it might be one threat that tips it over the edge, you know, the last 
three examples of a species get stood on, you know, but but getting stood on is not the overall threat. It's maybe land use change or um, potentially climate change or these kind of things. So I would say it's always good to try and conserve, you know, our native species. And if they're in your garden or somewhere like that, you do have the, the possibility to, to nurture them there and, you know, to, to help them grow and, and become more abundant there. Um, things that are maybe particularly problematic would be when you've got a very um, voracious disease that's very specific to a particular species. Ash dieback is a really good example um, where, you know, yeah, say just replanting a tree in an area where you know you have that disease. Yeah, it's going to get hit by it again, probably. Um, but if it's a more um, dynamic cause for being endangered, then then, yeah, it's great to try and replant them. and. Um, and there is a huge amount of work um, that goes into trying to preserve and propagate um, plants around the world. It's it doesn't get the same amount of airtime. It, it it because again, it's like the the idea of plant blindness is throughout all areas. Um, it's you know it sits at all levels. And um, people don't talk about it as much. People maybe aren't as interested in reading about it as much. Um, so it is definitely quieter. But then last year, for example, um, the State of the World's Plants and Fungi was released last year, um, led by Q. And that, you know, has huge volumes of information about what's happening, where we're at with, you know, extinction risks and, and the kind of work that is ongoing. Um, so it, it is definitely there and it is definitely being done. And there are some amazing success stories um of plants that have been you know brought back from the kind of the cusp of of extinction um so it is it is happening uh, is there a place in that i could get a list of plants in the west of ireland that are you know that i might decide well they'll work in my soil they'll work in my garden maybe i can try you know so what i would um there's two ways you could do it. One would be to look at the um, Irish red list of endangered species. I'll pop the link in the chat there. And that gives you the list of species that have been listed as critically endangered or endangered. Uh, trying to source any of those kind of things, I think would be quite difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I don't know, Maria might have some thoughts on that. I, I don't know. Um, but uh, you could also get in touch with the Botanic Gardens. They might be able to tell you something about that. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, just as as Maria said, native species, you know, everything that's native kind of needs a bit of a helping hand. Um, and there are some fantastic resources on, on native plants. Um, uh, Zoe Devlin's book, uh, Wildflowers of Ireland, is, is one of my favourites. You know, she's great ideas in them, but it's really, really user friendly. Um, and uh, there's there's lots on the, the Botanic Gardens, National Botanic Gardens website as well. Um, I'll pop the link into the red list because I think that's one that maybe people wouldn't necessarily find on their own. And it gives you a breakdown of kind of what is a bit, you know, what's more endangered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, anyone else? I know we're kind of over time, so I do want to finish up. Um, so if anyone has any last minute burning questions, please drop them in. I think, Michelle, you had a question. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I do. Actually, it's for um, Ida. Before I ask it, I just want to say thanks to Maria and Karen for all of your um, really valuable information that you've given us tonight. And sometimes when I hear all this information, I, I start to kind of feel kind of angsty, I suppose, about what are the solutions, you know? And then I always get really hopeful again when I see people like you educating us and talking about it and highlighting it. And that's what we're trying to do here this evening as well. And then I also get really hopeful when I see um, artists getting involved because I do believe that collaborations with, with a, a big mix of different professions is, is the way forward for um, solving these issues in the future. Um, so I, I just got really hopeful as well, Ida, when I saw your work and all the color testing and the different things that you're doing with plant specimens and everything like that. So I know someone had asked you earlier, um, you know, what, what kind of a, 
reaction you're getting from people who participate in your in your workshops so is there anything like really um in particular that you focus on to try and, and get people to become more aware like would you have one particular plant that you might think is easier to draw or are you trying to draw like a whole you know ecosystem of different plants um in your in your workshops with people or do you just single something out or do you kind of look at the overall kind of system no, that's I, there? I, I organize organize everything by color so uh again so i would start basically with the uh, pencils uh, so it will be basically uh looking, observing the plant without looking at color. Uh, so it, it doesn't matter what plant it is. Uh, when I teach in the burren, obviously I, I do um, uh, concentrate on, on, on weeds, but when I was teaching in IADT, uh, it, it was, we were working with, with different projects. Again, it's, it's all based on color. So it's pencils and then we, we, we would be moving to, to the color green and then uh, to yellow and reds. And so it, it's more about creating the colors, but uh, what I found absolutely beautiful, even when I teach uh, painting and it doesn't have to be botanical, but uh, after, um, I'd say after 15 days, people would come back to me and they would say, oh, I just uh, saw uh, this color and it's a mixture of ultramarine blue with lemon yellow. And then people start talking using uh, terms, you know, the specific colors. Mm -hmm. And you just realize, I mean, they realize that, uh, I mean, they're surrounded, we've been surrounded by those colors uh, all our lives. We just, if so we just didn't see them, you know? So by making, by creating those color charts, you, you are uh, bringing more attention to, to those colors and meaning, you know, nature or whatever is around you. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. I, I love color myself. So it's, it's something I try to play around with a lot, you know, but well, in my spare time <laughs> when I have some, but uh, yeah, that was very inspiring. Thank you. Uh, I actually have one small question and then I'm sorry, cause I know we're, we're holding people up here, but, um, with your uh, exhibition uh, with the mixture of plastic and organic material, will you be deciding to exhibit that over the long run, um, over the years to see how the organic matter decomposes and in comparison to the plastic or what's your plan? Well, uh, I'm actually, uh, our group, our AMI group is, uh, will be showing with uh, Goma in Waterford and uh, one of the, the big installation piece has a massive hole inside. So <laughs> the whole idea is for me to take pieces of my artwork, recycle them to create new artwork. So this is what I'm planning to do uh, as, as long as I can. It's just constantly recycling and creating something new and taking pieces. So uh, yeah, not really for sale. <laughs> Basically, I'm never going to make any money out of it. Yeah. You no, know, it'll just be really interesting to see a, a work piece over even five years to see how it would change. You know, um, yeah. I just I find it all very interesting. Thanks, Amelia. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you guys so much for joining us today, both the speakers and everyone for joining. It's been fascinating. Um, I'm actually sad now that this is the last of our talks. We do have tomorrow. There's two workshops on tomorrow and then that's our Wild Acres Week. Um, before I go again, uh, just a reminder that if anyone does want to put in um, an image to the Wild Postcard project that might turn into a, a postcard itself, it's the Wild Postcard Project at gmail.com. Um, and also just to mention that we are launching a biodiversity ambassador program, the first in Ireland um, come September. So if anyone would like to become a biodiversity ambassador with Green Sod, um, the information is on our website and you can find the information there and fill in an application form. We'd love to have you on board because biodiversity, as we can see from tonight, uh, definitely needs our help or at least our assistance to get involved and at least learn more about plants. I'm going to go and find my plant book this tonight and now start. I know what I'm doing for the weekend. Um, but again, thank you all so much. We really, really appreciate your time talking to us today and imparting all your information. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.